Good morning, dear professor. Good morning, how are you? I'm fine, what about you? I am well. So, well. we can continue your lecture today? Yep, uh, well, I won't talk nearly as long and we can get it finished off. Thank you for allowing me to finish it. I know I went too long or I guess I was just trying to go through the data effectively. So let me pull up my slides and we will finish. Share screen. I know, I'm just getting my slides up. Okay. All right, you can see it now? Yes, we can see your screen now. All right. So this is where we were. Um, yeah. I think we're one slide beyond this, but this is essentially where we were. Because um, we were talking about after, after uh, talking about targeted based therapy, which again only accomplished encompasses about 40% of non-small cell lung cancer. What do you do about everyone else? Because remember, as I said at the end, we rarely use chemotherapy alone. And I stand by that statement I made last week that we very, very rarely use chemotherapy alone. But if only 40% of people have driver mutations, what do we do about everyone else? And how do we profile those people in order to select the best possible therapies for them? So in addition to knowing, huh, in addition to knowing the mutational profiling on everyone, we also want to know these uh, three elements as well, because they will help tell us who's appropriate for immunotherapy alone, either as a singlet, a doublet, or combined with chemo. So these are the checkpoint inhibitors. The way checkpoint inhibitors work essentially is the ones that are currently available are either go after either PD PD1, PDL1, or CTLA4. In general, the idea behind all of these monoclonal antibodies is that they don't actually cause direct tumor damage or they're not directly tumorcidal. What they do is they activate the T cells and activate the immune system in a way that it can then recognize the cancer. Um, these drugs probably have been more powerful and more potent and more changing than the targeted therapies. What I mean by that is that these drugs became FDA approved or widely available in the United States in approximately 2016. When they became widely available, it dramatically changed the job of the average US oncologist. While targeted therapies, um, as you saw on some of the slides, you can get people, what was 63% of people getting elect, taking electinib for alive at five years, um, that's a tiny little subset. Uh, as opposed to immunotherapy, it was a tiny little subset of people have ALK mutations um, or ALK rearrangements rather. But immunotherapy is much more broadly applicable to patients and was very quickly found to be superior to chemotherapy. Um, and really with the idea of it shifting that 1% of people alive at four years, if you remember, that's what we had, I had shown on one of the first slides was the bar we were trying to move. Because if you're talking about keeping people alive longer, because really the definition of success in oncology from a patient point of view is you give them their life back. They go back to being alive. They go back to not having side effects. They go back to not being treated. And also while the overall survival with the targeted therapies was, imp I believe, impressive getting two thirds of people alive at five years with ALK, for example, with electinib, um, People were still on therapy. 
So people were still having to pay for and obtain those pills and take them every day. And many of those people who are alive uh, at five years, that's also, we're not, still not on electinib. That was overall survival, not progression-free survival. And something else to remember is that ALK, EGF, ALK, EGFR, and ROS1 mutated and rearranged cancers respectively are also more chemosensitive. So part of the reason those people are alive out at five years is not only the targeted agent, which they're uh, possibly on for three or four years, but then whenever they eventually do fail that, they are very chemosensitive. So that probably plays a large role in how so many people were still alive in the Alex study, which was the electinib study. The difference with immunotherapy is immunotherapy is a fixed duration therapy. So when you give these monoclonal antibodies to people, you the lung cancer studies gave them for two years. If someone was in a remission, or rather everyone stopped in the studies at two years, there's a large amount of debate currently in the US if two years is the right number, because it was an arbitrary number that was essentially made up by the drug company. So no one actually has any real idea if two years is the right number. We know that the only studies that we know about are retrospective studies, and they say that less than one year is worse than greater than one year of a checkpoint inhibitor or of immunotherapy. But that's really all we know. Um, so generally, we'll treat for two years. So we have a fixed duration therapy now that's more broadly applicable applicable. And this is one of the first studies looking at this is looking at the uh, one of the first phase two studies with non small cell lung cancer. This is a non randomized study. And this is looking at patients uh, stratified by what their uh, the staining of their cells for PD one. Abbreviations change with time. This is an older paper. So that's why they're calling PD-1 staining PS. But when you look at this study, again, it was a single arm study with 100, arm, 100 patients or 200 patients or so. But when you're looking at it, people who had uh, PD-L1 staining of their tumor of over 50% at the two year mark, 60% of them were alive, doing well and keeping in mind that therapy would stop right here. This does not have enough follow-up um, to go beyond this for you, to, uh, on this slide anyway, to say what happens after you stop, but you can clearly see that these patients are doing dramatically better than you would expect with chemotherapy. Because remember the chemotherapy curves from Judith uh, that I showed, which was the 1,000 patient randomized, Judith Schiller, the 1,000 patient randomized study that I showed you in the beginning, chemotherapy curves with carbotaxol all went down to the ground here. And when you look at um, adibibacizumab, you maybe get to here uh, with the survival curves. Adding denosumab, zometa does not change those survival curves. But when you find the 30, 40% of people who are PDL1 positive, look at the differences that you can make. The one caveat to make right away though is PD1, PDL1 status, and in fact, all immunotherapy um, targeting needs to be done within the context of understanding their mutational profile. All of these patients were excluded if they had EGFR, ALK, or ROS1 rearrangements or mutations. Because remember, those are typically non-smoking related cancers, and hence they are genomically simple. The way immunotherapy works by triggering the T cells to be activated by either blocking PDL1, PD1, or CTLA4 is you have the tumors recognizing neoantigens. I mean, you have the immune system recognizing neoantigens. In smoking-related malignancies, there's a ton more neoantigens than in non-smoking-related malignancies. The tumor DNA is way more complex, leading to more targets and more ability for the immune system to attack something. In non-smoking-related malignancies, such as EGFR, ALK, and ROS1 mutated and rearranged malignancies, 
the immunotherapy is not nearly as effective. And in fact, we almost never use it, except I'll show you at the very end slide when you, we can consider using it. But if someone was PDL one one hundred percent and had an EGFR mutation, we would absolutely go after the EGFR mutation, not the PDL one. So that's something important to remember with this. So you can't just say, okay, well, look at this great outcome. All we need to do is find our PDL one uh, patients. Um, you still actually need to do the other comprehensive profiling to make sure that they don't harbor an EGFR or an ALK or a ROS1 uh, lesion. Uh, so this study, though, led to follow up. Oh, and I put this graph in here just nicely to show you what I was trying to just show by drawing right here. This is the study where you're looking at carboplatinum paclitaxel versus carboplatinum Paclitaxel and Bevacizumab showing their 24 month survival was around 20% versus in even PDL1 negative patients. You don't have enough follow up to say, but low PDL1 expression, you're still doing better by using an immunotherapy alone because this is single agent Pembro. There's no chemotherapy involved. Um, then looking at it based on if it was first or second line, right here, one thing that's it has to be impressive when you're looking at this. This is people who had no previous treatment um, in this study who were uh, treated with pembrolizumab. You're looking out at 16 months. These patients, which were, there were 20 of them, only one died in 16 months um, out of 20. So 19 out of 20 were still going. That has to be impressive. After previous therapy or a second line, you can see that the outcomes uh, are a little bit inferior, but there's more patients. So it, this might just also be a, a factor of that there were so few first line patients here. That might be why the curve looks so good, but nevertheless, these curves are not even close to anything you would ever see with chemotherapy. They completely blow chemotherapy out of the water. Um, then this is the follow-up for that. And now we get to our five-year question that I postulated at, or proposed at the beginning of the, that at the beginning of the um, last lecture, looking at this. So this is five-year overall survival rates from patients treated from those graphs I just showed with five-year follow-up, treated with pembrolizumab. Okay, remember if you use chemotherapy, five-year overall survival rate is less than 1%. So five-year overall survival um, in people who were current or former smokers treated with Pembro was one out of four. Um, adenocarcinomas were one out of four. Previously treated patients um, did significantly worse, really arguing to try to use these as frontline where if you can potentially get someone, and keep in mind, a lot of these people never actually received chemotherapy. They only received pembrolizumab for two years. You then stopped therapy, and for the next three years, they had an unmaintained remission, um, which is really quite impressive that you can do that to a quarter of these patients. So there's no ongoing cost. There's no ongoing anything. Um, and then the question comes up, are they cured? Their CAT scans are normal. They have no side effects. They have no symptoms. They are back to normal. Have you actually cured these patients? So based on that uh, Keynote 01 study that I just went through in detail with you, that phase one, phase two study, uh, there was a randomized phase three study. Uh, launched called Keynote 24. This was a randomized phase three trial of up to six cycles of chemotherapy um, versus using pembrolizumab uh, for two years, 35 cycles is two years, because um, it's given once every three weeks. You can see that they had to exclude uh, EGFR and ALK mutations for the reasons I said before, they're genomically simple, therefore they don't have neoantigens, therefore they do not respond nearly as well to immunotherapy, and that who had a pdl one staining of greater than or equal to 50%. Um, so this was directly challenging chemotherapy now, saying, hey, can we get rid of chemo? Can we only give these people uh, immunotherapy? <clears throat> 
in the first line. So looking at this is the progression free and overall survival curves. Um, looking at this, you can see based on PDL one staining, the progression free survival uh, was um, obviously superior for pembrolizumab, essentially doubling that of what you would receive with chemotherapy. And looking at overall survival, again, uh, significant improvement in overall survival. You might immediately ask, hey, why was the chemo arm performing so well? Well, that's because remember in the study design, they were allowed to cross over. So whenever they failed chemotherapy, they went on to Pembro. So that's probably why these people did so well. So whenever they had their progression event sometime in the first year, they were then flipped over to Pembrolizumab. And that's why they were probably doing so well overall, because while it is less effective in the second line, Pembro is still a heck of a good drug, even in second line lung cancer, and is dramatically better than something such as docetaxel. Because remember, that's the other standard. So after you fail platinum-based chemotherapy, if you're living in a chemotherapy-only world, you don't retreat with platinums. You either treat with docetaxel or pemetrexid. But with those drugs, you have response rates in the order of uh, you, those uh, order of eight percent, I believe, was the docetaxel, um, and that was matched by by uh, pemetrexid, and you had overall survivals in the seven to eight month range, as opposed to if you remember from the five year follow up from Kino one, the uh, five year overall survival was still. 15, 16% in people who receive second line therapy, whereas you would expect a, and that's an unmaintained, again, even in second line, you only give the Pembro for two years, unmaintained survival, which is dramatically better than anything you could expect or anticipate to receive from chemotherapy alone. But it's a lot more complicated than just knowing um, your PDL one status, because in addition to having to know your PDL one status, um, you have to understand other biomarkers so you can try to move this curve and do things even better. So looking at it, um, this is some of the work that we have done or that uh, my group has done looking at other ways to predict responses to immunotherapy in non-small cell lung cancer. In this study, what we did was we sequenced um, around 500 genes in uh, 50 non-small cell lung cancer patients or 50 uh, cancer patients. You can see the different types of malignancies here. We'll focus on the lung cancer patients though. Nevertheless, we sequenced these genes and then we looked for a uh, number of coding changes and we looked at pdl one status. And really what we were trying to do is trying to quantify, did it matter how many coding changes were there? We weren't looking for synonymous uh, mutations or synonymous uh, SNPs or single nucleotide polymorphisms. We were looking for actually how many times was there a coding change that would also predict a change in the protein. So we were trying to figure out the number of neoantigens and does that matter? N not really caring if they're quote unquote pathologic changes, just are they changes that would lead to a new protein? And looking at this, um, the total number, this is looking at individual patients versus how many al genomic alterations did they have. That's just in the blue area curve, just showing the distribution of those on the histogram. One thing that's important is that pathogenic mutations in almost all the patients um, actually were the minority versus the variance of undetermined significance, i.e. coding changes that change protein structure that we don't really know if it changes function, but it's going to change the way the protein works. So what we were trying to do is trying to get a feel for the total mutational burden and then correlate that to response with the idea that the total mutational burden in some way should represent the amount of neoantigens that a malignancy would have. So when we looked at the top quartile of patients, the top 20% or the people, the 20% of patients who had the most mutations versus the other patients, there was a dramatic difference in response to immunotherapy, which is what you would expect uh, to an extent. And by these curves going down, that just means no more patients at risk. It does not mean that suddenly all the people died. Um, but again, that top quartile treated with any kind of checkpoint inhibitor did dramatically better. Um, and PDL1 did not predict in this uh, subset of patients, which is interesting. Um, 
maybe arguing there's things other than PDL1 status. I, I know I just showed you how PDL1 with Pembro can really show you that there are different outcomes, but is there another way to look at it? So at the same time that we were publishing, uh, this was also published at ASCO in 2016, the same year that we presented that data at ASCO. And ASCO, for anyone who who's not familiar with it, is the American Society of Clinical Oncology. It's the big annual meeting in Chicago every year in the United States, where there's somewhere around 10,000 oncologists from around the world who come. So it's a wonderful meeting if you ever get the chance to go. Anyway, this is another group that at the same time that we were doing, we're also looking at total mutational load. Rather than looking at quartiles, they were trying to find the inflection point or the cut point um, for how many mutations per megabase of DNA would predict outcomes. And they were showing similar things to what we did. The more mutation you had, regardless of PDL1 staining, um, the better the outcomes. One thing just to throw a wrinkle in it, this is uh, another one of our papers from JCO uh, where we were looking at, does it matter where you look for the mutational burden or not? Um, i.e. asking the question for intra-patient intra, intra tumor heterogeneity, if that makes sense. What the question we were asking is, if we're going to be reliant on these biomarkers, does it matter if we biopsy the primary or does it matter if we biopsy a metastasis, uh, if that makes sense, right? So is the primary malignancy similar to a metastatic lesion as far as profiling goes, or are they different? Uh, because again, if we're putting all of this weight on PDL1 staining, and now I'm starting the story of putting it on mutational load and number of mutations, does it matter where we're actually getting that information? So looking at this table, where we did the sequencing of what three or four thousand patients um, and looking at primary tumors versus metastases and then we could see that there were differences in um, pdl1 staining based on where you biopsied okay metastases for example were more likely to be pdl1 positive um, in any fashion than primaries so that's something to take off right off the bat. So if you biopsy the lung and you do PDL1 staining, that PDL1 staining will likely, but not necessarily, correlate with the PDL1 staining from a adrenal gland. Sorry, the air conditioner just kicked on and that's very loud. I'm gonna move. Um, does not necessarily correlate. And then if you look at mutations per megabase, you can see where there's a distinct change right there as well, where the number of mutations per megabase for a metastasis versus a primary is different in this study, um, including even the median number. Okay, so the thing that that brings up right away is wanting to know where you're getting your information from for choosing, right? So even if you say, well, this is only a 7% difference, but remember, we're with lung cancer, we're really trying to parse people out into as small boxes as possible to understand them to the best of our ability so we can target them the best we can. I mean, if we're worried about finding a 1% out positive patients, it, it does bear in mind that it may be also worth knowing where the immunotherapy profiling was done and why it in that clearly can matter. And in general, metastases are going to have a higher rate of immunotherapy uh, response, predicted response, because they're going to have more biomarkers, as we show in this table. The problem is the studies that were done did not go through and categorize where the biopsies were done from, though. So extrapolating this back to the study makes it like the Keynote 01 and Keynote 024 makes it somewhat difficult. But in general, in clinical practice, thinking that if you're going to profile something and you want to give someone the highest chance of re receiving immunotherapy, you probably should profile the metastasis. 
This is looking at the correlation between PDL1 and PD, uh, PDL1 and mutation expression and mutations per megabase. Um, again, as you can see here with the lines of correlation, both, both in adenocarcinomas and squamous cell carcinomas, there's actually very poor correlation between PDL1 expression and mutations per megabase, arguing that these are independent things that can predict response uh, to therapy. Also, more than just saying metastasis, it matters what metastasis you're talking about when you're sending profiling. This is again looking in the top bar graphs at lung adenocarcinomas and the bottom bar graph looking at lung squamous cell carcinomas. You can see that the number of mutations per megabase varies uh, based on which metastasis you actually decided to biopsy. Okay, so this is looking at people with a frequency of greater than 10 mutations per megabase. The reason that we chose that number to look at is because that's the number that will define people who do not need chemotherapy. People who have more than 10 mutations per megabase can be treated with double immunotherapy, as I will soon show you, and not receive chemotherapy. Um, just like people who are PDL1 50% or greater will not receive chemotherapy. So we're creating a second group now of patients, independent, as I showed you on the last correlation plot, of PDL1 staining who may respond to immunotherapy. Really, just to drive that home, right? So this is looking at mutations per megabase if we have a cut of 10. So basically all of these patients right here, you would just be giving doublet immunotherapy to. All of these patients cutting at 10 and over, all of them. They have pd one expressions too low to get single agent Pembro, but you get this huge chunk of patients who are pd one negative, but have a high TMB or to, uh, who therefore would get doublet immunotherapy. And you're left just with a small fraction of patients who you have to use chemotherapy and immunotherapy in. Nevertheless, it matters where what site you use to uh, do your profiling. So if you're trying to stack the deck to give immunotherapy, send brain mets. They're much more likely than bone mets to give you an answer um, for how many mutations. And again, this is showing that 38% of metastases will qualify for immunotherapy versus 25% of primaries. Um, so it matters where you send your samples from. And finally, this is now looking at a Venn diagram that was published, not by me, but still out of my group, um, where that we looked at over, whoops, over 11,000 patients and correlated PDL1 high versus high TMB versus MSI high. And with the Venn diagrams, we were showing that um, these things, while they often overlap, they do not exclusively overlap. So that's why you actually need to check for all three to determine the best possible treatment for your patient that does not have a driver mutation, which is why I listed all three, because they're actually independent as I've shown you. they all can independently predict response to immunotherapy. Okay, so going on to this, this was looking at ipilimumab and nivolumab, which are two um, immunotherapy agents. This is Nevo is a PDL1 inhibitor, ipilimumab is a CTLA4 inhibitor, and then this is looking at it versus platinum-based chemotherapy. So this was looking at people. We're going to pretend like PDL1 doesn't exist because that's not what the study looked at. Um, in the end, that's what all the analysis is. But this is looking at people with stage four lung cancer, first line therapy because as I've already shown you, immunotherapy works better best when it's done first line, and they have to have no alterations in EGFR or ALK, because as we've already stated, those are chemotherapy, I mean, those are genomically more simple lesions. Less likely to have neoantigens and less likely to respond to IO. So they're generally excluded. So this is again, it's chemo versus immunotherapy. So trying to get rid of chemotherapy. The uh, it randomized a thousand patients. Again, remember back when I was talking about who you give therapy to, less than 1% of people had a P performance status of two. 
So really, people who have a performance status of anything other than zero and one are typically not eligible for chemotherapy or for therapy with metastatic non-small cell lung cancer. As we would expect in a population that was skewed not to have driver mutations, 87% of them were smokers and 71% were uh, 71 percent were adenocarcinomas. Interestingly, um, 30% of the people were PDL1 completely negative. Uh, so we're not using PDL1 here to define responses. We're looking for a PDL1 independent responses in these thousand patients. So this is now looking at all randomized patients versus the 10 mutations per megabase. If you look at all randomized patients, regardless of any biomarker, actually Ipinevo does better at one year than uh, chemo. So you might beg the question, do we need to check any biomarkers? Um, but it beat it. But when you really look at people who had 10 mutations per megabase or more, um, you're looking at a one-year progression-free survival of 43% in a chemotherapy-free treatment. And these people do dramatically better and tolerate therapy dramatically better than they do with chemotherapy. And this chemotherapy curve looks a lot like you would expect it to with almost everyone dead, um, though there was crossover some, but almost everyone dead at 12 months. It looks like the other chemotherapy studies. This I put this arrow in just to point out one small phenomenon. Um, immunotherapy is slow to work. So in someone who has a very large tumor burden, you can sometimes consider chemotherapy. And we'll go through that in a little bit. That was defined by the, the Keynote 9LA study. But nevertheless, just keep in mind, immunotherapy takes about a month to kick in for a lot of patients. So don't necessarily, so if you have someone who's high disease burden, there's nothing wrong with giving them a cycle of carbotaxol with ipilimumab and nivolumab. So giving them four drugs, the only real extra toxicity there is financial because you're giving four drugs, but you can get rid of that little divot in the curve and have the higher tumor burden patients respond earlier. Um, So looking at pdl one expression, you can see it does not matter in the context of high total mutations. So whether your pdl one is high or nothing, you still have over 40% of people with doublet immunotherapy responding. There is more risk with doublet immunotherapy. You quote people about a 1% chance of death when you put in the ipilimumab because that's a more dangerous drug. Um, but this is clearly better curves than you would see with chemo. I mean, this is a randomized study. You are clearly seeing the difference, but you know, the PDL one greater than 50%, you're going to be giving single agent Pembro to because it's safer, but in anyone who's PDL one under 50% who has 10 mutations per megabase, you have very persuasive data here to use double immunotherapy, even for PDL one negative, because you can beat the pants off of chemo. Um, this is again, further follow-up looking at it and chemotherapy. And this is looking at nivolumab plus chemotherapy, which is not something that is done very frequently anymore. Um, it used to be one of the standards and you can see where that beats it as well. Um, but again, this cross with, when you throw in the chemotherapy, this is what I was stating before. You can see where the orange line is immunotherapy alone. You're losing early, especially in your high tumor load. By kicking that couple cycles of chemotherapy in with your immunotherapy, you can save more people who are higher tumor burden early, if that makes sense. You get more of a rapid response. Okay, this is now looking at some of the most impressive stuff. This is looking at the duration of response. So these are patients who were PDL1 negative and had greater than 10 mutations per megabase. So these are people who you would never consider using Pembro alone in, okay? So with chemotherapy, one thing to point out is no one responded for greater than a year to chemotherapy um, versus duration of response to people who had either a CR or a PR. The one year duration of response was 93% with Ipinevo. So in people who were actually responding, and that is um, right around 40% of people, um, right around 40% of people, you can see how dramatic their 
and how durable the responses can be. This is just looking at the overall response rates. Again, you see that exact same number that I quoted from 1999 from Judith Schiller using carbotaxel, 20%. That's what you almost always see in large studies for chemotherapy response rates. The doubled immunotherapy almost doubles that um, within a chemo-free situation. And obviously the duration of responses is dramatically different. Um, you know which one you would want to receive. This is now looking at two-year overall survival with follow-up, and you're at 40% versus 30% with chemo. And remember, a lot of these people are crossing over. You're improving your median survival, et cetera. Um, this is looking at people who are PDL1 negative versus PDL1 positive. Remember, PDL1 positive patients actually also respond better to chemotherapy, just like EGFR patients do. So that's why the chemotherapy curve looks better for the PDL1 positive. But as you can see, also, you're developing a nice plateau, actually, because you know every one of these dots represents an individual patient. Um, this is looking at people who are all coming into the four-year interval being alive. And this is really what we see, because we stop therapy right here. And then these are people in unmaintained Right? So this is people with stage four cancer on no therapy, stopping right here, where you, you're going to lose a few because you're going to drop from about 40% to about 35%. But the majority of these people are now alive a year or more out um, on no therapy. Uh, this is just looking to show that Ipinevo is better than chemo in every subset. Um, so clearly just beating that point home, Ipinevo for anyone who's PDL1, 49% or less with 10 mutations per megabase. Um, even though the lower ones still had a response and still actually did better than chemo, if we're looking to define subgroups, that mutations per megabase of greater than 10, because this is really the one point, this is the PDL1 negative mutation per megabase greater than 10. Your hazard ratio is all the way down to 0.5. You're clearly doing dramatically better than chemotherapy. For your overall survival data, so we're trying to get to that four or five year overall survival, and we're looking right at about one out of three patients are alive um, from this study. Uh, and this is again just showing that in various ways that at that four-year survival, 30, 40% of people are alive. If they're PD-L1 positive, if they're PD-L1 negative, they are, you're getting somewhere again at that four-year survival, one out of four patients alive um, in unmaintained responses. Dramatically better than that, less than 1% at five years, again, you guys will get copy, you're recording this, so you have copies of all these slides. This is just looking at all the different subgroups, emphasizing over and over again that there is no subgroup based on PDL1 expression where someone who has 10 mutations per megabase or more, that Ipinevo does not crush chemotherapy, right? You're looking at chemotherapy survival rates of 3%. And keep in mind, a lot of these people would have gotten immunotherapy as second or third line therapy. Um, despite that, um, despite that, uh, you're not able to rescue them. So doing the immunotherapy up front and getting it going up front is really what is impressive. And if you're looking, for example, for durations of response, median duration of response in greater than 50%. Uh, PDL1 for Ipinevo was 32 months versus five for chemo. If you're looking at PDL1 negative, duration of response was 18 months versus chemo's four. So keep in mind that remember when we looked at what the addition of Bevacizumab can do, it could bring your entire um, survival up to 14 months, which is inferior to your expected duration of response for the 40% of people who would respond to immunotherapy. Clearly, completely different animal. And also keep in mind, there you see no survival curves like this for the addition of denosumab or Zomeda. Though those are commonly used, they don't change survival. So resource-limited situations, choosing what you get to use, clearly I would want to choose to, choose to appropriately genomically profile my patients. And, and attempt to get them on an immunotherapy. Um, this is a cute 
study, a uh, cute thing to look at that you can say to your patients for no pain, no gain. People who have immune reactions uh, do better than people who do not. So if you get side effects um, and we have to stop your immunotherapy, you're actually more likely to be alive and respond, um, which is, I guess, just a, a surrogate for um, a surrogate for survival and uh, surrogate for showing that the immune system has been activated. It's interesting when you're treating people with immunotherapy with melanoma, the people who respond get uh, vitiligo. They um, almost all get vitiligo if they respond. If they don't respond, they don't get vitiligo, which makes sense. With lung cancer, remember TTF1, right? That's one of the markers that we use to define an adenocarcinoma of the lung, right? That's a thyroid protein, right? That's expressed in the lung. Uh, people who get thyroiditis from immunotherapy typically do much better than people who do not, okay, um, with lung cancer. But that's not true in melanoma. Uh, in melanoma, it's vitiligo that does it. So looking for some type of other similar target effect and similar evidence of immune activation, you can actually also predict outcomes. So when you cause a side effect and the patient comes in and complains, you know, when you're giving chemo, you say, oh, I'm so sorry, let me fix that. With immunotherapy, you're like, oh, yeah, that's great. I'm glad I caused that. Okay. So, again, conclusions. Um, you're keeping around a quarter of people alive. Discontinuation does because of their uh, immune therapy reactions does not decrease uh, survival. In fact, it probably gives you some idea that they are going to survive and this is an option for first-line treatment of metastatic non-small cell lung cancer, arguing again against chemotherapy. All right, so now this is looking at Keynote 9LA. So this is looking at four cycles of chemotherapy. So we're just gonna keep beating up chemotherapy um, versus Ipinevo plus two cycles. The place that you would use this is you would use this in someone Though the study looked at a lot of people, which we'll look, which we'll go through, the place of this falls into modern management of lung cancer, right? So, modern management of lung cancer is check for a stage four lung cancer, check for a driver. If no driver, check for PDL one. PDL one's over fifty percent, Pembro alone. PDL one's under fifty percent, check for total mutational load. If total mutational loads over ten mutations per megabase, ipinevo alone, no chemo. If you are PDL one negative and you are less than 10 mutations per megabase with no driver, which now you're down to about 10, 20% of people with non-small cell lung cancer, this is what you would give them. You, or if this, you had a patient who had a high tumor burden, this is what you would give them, okay? Because um, again, remember that immunotherapy is slower to act. So this is again, looking at a large randomized phase three study, two cycles of chemotherapy with Ipinevo versus chemotherapy, including with Pemetrexid maintenance, Again, no ALK or EGFR mutations, first line therapy for stage four disease, and you're treating for two, up to two years. It's randomizing 700 patients. This just shows that the randomization worked. Also note, no performance status to patients. Um, again, making that point. Uh, PDL one expression was over 50% in about uh, a quarter of patients. Uh, keeping in mind that those are going to be more chemotherapy sensitive patients and not someone that you would actually give this therapy to usually. Um, not modernly anyway. Okay. Uh, so this is looking at the interim analysis. So when we look at it for overall survival, adding Ipinevo to all comers, regardless of any uh, total mutational load or PDL1 status improves outcomes over <coughs> improves outcomes over chemotherapy alone and you also get rid of the divot in the beginning when you do that so you don't have those people who have high mutational loads and high uh, tumor loads just blowing through your immunotherapy you actually get rid of that and you can see the outcomes are quite good looking at the forest plot. Um, the thing to really look at the most is looking at PDL1 status, um, showing that even in PDL1 negative patients, this was superior to chemotherapy. Um, it, histology wise, superior to chemotherapy alone. And again, 
these graphs are all so much better than anything I showed you in the beginning with chemo because these people are being rescued by immunotherapy to an extent in the chemotherapy arm second line. And they're not, because remember with chemo, they're all dead right here. So these people are all being rescued by immunotherapy to an extent, but when you use it first line, you're getting better outcomes. Uh, PDL1 status did not matter because there's no major difference in any of these curves. Uh, perform when you're looking at PFS, again, you're getting right at that 30% of people with durable responses. Um, and uh, you're actually improving your response rate, including getting some CRs. This is again, looking at duration of response, just beating a dead horse, which is a American phrase, which I'm not sure if it's used in Uzbekistan, but I'm just basically set, showing over and over again that with first line addition of immunotherapy to chemotherapy in the only place again, we use in that one subset that I defined, but you can see it improves outcomes and gives durable responses over chemotherapy alone. Again, beating a dead horse. People who get chemo immunotherapy, a third of them are still in uh, responding to therapy at two years versus no one really with chemo. PDL1, again, duration of response, looking at chemotherapy, no one is still responding at two years. 45% of people are still responding with immunotherapy and continue to respond after you stop therapy. Just beating it into the ground and into the ground. Immunotherapy is dramatically better than chemotherapy. And so in conclusion, don't use chemotherapy except for that one subset of PDL1 less than 50%, TMB under 10, and then you're only using two cycles and you're combining it with immunotherapy. Um, but the last subset of patients that I will talk about is looking at never smokers, right? Because these are the people who are going to have uh, more genomically simple tumors. They're going to have EGFR or ALK lesions. So this was Empower 150. <coughs> this is the only study to ever show a benefit in people who have EGFR mutations to an immunotherapy uh, drug set. So this is looking at people who you randomized to uh, atezolizumab and bevacizumab and carboplatin and paclitaxel then maintained with atezobev. There is some interaction between atezobev that allows atezo, which is a PDL1 inhibitor, to see genomically simple cancers. As you know, this is one of the, this is actually the first line treatment for metastatic HCC in the US is the tezobev because those are relatively genomically simple tumors. Bev by itself doesn't do very much. A tezo by itself doesn't do very much, but there's clearly some type of synergy between the VEGF um, monoclonal antibodies and the PDL1 monoclonal antibodies. So this is showing that people actually who had EGFR mutations benefited. Okay, so this is looking at the hazard ratio. Obviously, adding a Tezo is better than not. Just take in uh, people who are EGFR positive patients. This has not been shown in any other study. And you can see the hazard ratios were extremely good um, for these patients who had mutations. There is no other combination or study showing out there that people who are EGFR mutated or ALK mutated can respond to immunotherapy. That's why they're excluded from all the studies. Um, so really, once you run out of targeted therapy options using an Empower 150 regimen, which again is carboplatin, paclitaxel, bevacizumab, and tezolizumab, so incredibly financially toxic regimen, um, but you can actually get durable responses with these patients who have mutations. And that is it. Thank you guys very much for hanging with me for 116 slides spread over two hours. And any questions? Uh, thank you, dear professor. And there is no questions in the chat. So, but it was very interesting for us because immunotherapy, as you know, is not so frequently used in our country. But uh, the results of it is very impressive, I think. Maybe after several years, it will be available for every patient. So we are hoping the better future. <laughs> yeah, I mean, because the thing is though, like we had talked before, 
it's also in a place where there's limited resources choosing how you spend your money right because like last time there was a question about how do you treat bone mets which was the leading question for hey add denosumab denosumab costs money and it doesn't change survival pet scans you don't if you have obvious metastatic disease you don't need a pet scan right so lots of people spend money on things that don't change outcomes getting a foundation one profiling gives you the ability to identify patients where you can dramatically improve uh, outcomes and save lives. So I, I think that the idea of not of rationing or deciding where to put the money, what bucket to put the money in is, is very important. And it's not just necessarily who wants to show off their most newfangled pet scanner. It, though those are impressive, um, they don't change lives and this stuff changes lives. So what will be your next lecture? What do you want it to be on? Maybe it's, uh, it will be interesting about triple negative breast cancer. I heard that it's very impressive data about yeah. using of immunotherapy. Yeah, I will definitely give a lecture on that. Let me tell you though, it does not look like the data that I just showed you. Mm. So the uh, Atezo uh, Abraxane data does not look like this. It is. Mm. It is definitely better than using uh, chemo alone, but you don't get these 40% of people alive, 25% of people alive at four and five years. The curves still co collapse around 14 months, which is good for triple negative, but the curves collapse. They, they don't get these beautiful long responses, but sure, I can definitely give a lecture on triple negative. Okay. Okay, see you next time. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Okay.